All right, so yesterday we all um, sort of heard about and learned about the VTI1 process, which is how citizens and governments collaboratively identify issues uh, to solve for society. And today, Fang, who's leading um, today's workshop, will delve into methods and design tools to actually solve identified issues collaboratively across stakeholders. A couple of housekeeping things, bathrooms on all sides of you, Wi-Fi password is up there, Prime Produce One and PPNY is the network, um, especially for um, those who are here today for the first time. Welcome. Uh, also, thank you to our um, sponsors, Composites Collective, Awesome Foundation, Serapis, and Beta NYC, American Assembly, ThoughtWorks, um, Personal Democracy Media that helped us get all of the VR equipment we'll be using tonight. All right, and Orbital, who hosts us week after week after week. <laughs> we'll do a quick um, exercise. Yeah, we're gonna do a quick uh, morning exercise to wake up our brains today. Just a show of hands, how many people were not here yesterday? Okay, three of you. Um, cool, so what I would suggest for this exercise, since you weren't here, is you can kind of roam around and observe what people are writing. Um, but for those that were here, we're going to do a silent mind mapping exercise. What's going to happen is you're going to pair off into groups of three, about three or two to three. You can come grab a flip chart and station yourselves around. And you're going to, for about five minutes, just write out and draw everything or anything that you remember from yesterday's V Taiwan training. Um, and the key is that it's one silent. And ideally, everyone in that group has a marker. Everyone has a marker and is drawing. And if you can, see if you can start connecting the thoughts that your group is coming up with. Um, is everyone aware of what a mind map is or looks like? Would anyone like a demonstration of what a mind map is or looks like? OK, great. Uh, let me actually, I'm going to come back here to this board. So a mind map is a visualization tool of ideas. So if yesterday was V Taiwan, and let's say I might mind map this, I might start by putting V Taiwan in the center, and then I might say, okay, I remember there are four stages. Uh, I remember Orid, I remember Polis, and you don't, ideally you can start connecting them, but also just let your brain put the ideas down. Right? If you are more of a visual person, maybe you'll draw instead of write, and we'll get like a fun combination of just whatever you remember from yesterday. It's a nice moment to reflect. Questions? There's flip charts up here, so if you want to come grab a flip chart, and we've got markers, there's also markers on your table. Um, and you don't, you can pair off into different groups. You can use this extra table over here if there are computers on the tables. Maybe we can move them down to the chairs. And just pair off in groups of three or two. Here, you might, well, you can have a clean one that doesn't have an icebreaker at the top. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have to be perfect. Find some space. If you want big markers, there's also Sharpies on your table. Who needs paper? Yeah, markers, team of three. Any any group of people, just find three people. Hey, Kate. Good. There's one up there. There's a good one. You can put them up on the on the walls. Just make sure everyone is settled. Okay, too many people here. How about another sheet? I'm sorry. Here you go. Thank you. 
Wait, wait, wait. Don't start yet, please. We're going to all start at the same time and end at the same time. Okay, so we've got that group, this group, this group, are we good here? Okay, everyone's got markers, need some markers? Here you go. All right, everyone's got a marker, right? Everyone's got your group, everyone's got paper. So. I'm going to start the timer. We've got five minutes in silence. All right, go for it. And ideally, you can all kind of work at once. So give space to people, let them come in. R folks. Hey, everyone, please, this is a silent mind mapping exercise. Silent. Silent. So just start drawing. Connect what you can, but everyone can work at once.
We've got about 30 seconds left. Okay, pens and markers down. So if you can bring your charts over this way and we can put them on the back sides of these cardboard things, you can stick them up. And also there's those two walls over there. And then once they're all up, we'll just take a few minutes to walk around and take a look at other people's charts and see what they remembered. Maybe there's something that you didn't remember. Want to bring yours over here? Yeah, we can. There. There's space on these two doors also. Here's uh, Stephanie, you wanna, you wanna put that one over here? There we go, we can put that one over here. All right, and then just take a few minutes to take a look at these. Notice if there's any connections that someone else made that you didn't or something that you might've forgotten. And as you finish up and you feel that you've gotten to take a look at everything, please come on back and please notice if you have what color sticker you have and make sure that you are correctly in your group. So if you haven't noticed already, you have a little color on your name tags. And they match to the little dots in the right of these issue sheets. Pink group, orange group, and green group. Great, thank you. You don't have to, but I'll invite an open space on the floor if anyone wants to share any reflections on the exercise or the process or yesterday before we move on. Yes? 
I'm very thankful for the opportunity for you all to be here. So thank you very much. Um, I'm very, uh, one thing that I haven't seen so far is kind of like a listing of the technical, to well, uh, kind of like a, the, um, the technology requirements that you've used. If there is any way that that could be spelled out, um, you know, like number of iPads, uh, yeah, stuff like that. But I just want to say thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Hi, before I hand it over to Fang, um, if you haven't noticed, especially for those, those of you who are here for the first time today, we have uh, Jolly who's going to record this whole thing. So thank you to Jolly, thank you to Internet Society, and I'm hoping you don't have problems with being recorded. Hello. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Fang, and I'm a service design consultant at the public digital innovation space, uh, as known as PDIS. And today, we're going to do um, the whole day workshop, including trainings and simulation of the PO network and collaboration workshop. And before I go into the details of the PO network and um, the collaboration workshop, um, I would like to share with you some of the PD's culture before, but just before that, uh, make sure that you got all the workshop materials. Um, there is a hyperlink where you can get all of, all of the hack folders and it includes slides and the workshop materials. So I would like to share with you about PD's culture and value that correspond to the PO network and collaboration workshops. This picture represents the working culture embedded in our team and something we like to develop within the civil servants and to the wider public. The notion of uh, the small impact and can eventually transform into significant change. And here you can see we've did, um, sorry that the, the presenter is not, uh, the projector is not clear, but you will be able to see that um, on your laptop if you have one or on your phone. But I will zoom in so that you can see it better. Um, there are four, uh, five values that uh, we came out in the workshop within the team last year. And the top priority of the value that we have is to build the trust between citizens and the government. And the second one is to cultivate the civil society organizations and citizens by raising um, awareness on public issues and enhancing their capability to participate in public affairs. In order to make this happen, it's important to ease civil servants' workflow. Also, it's important for us to promote the value of digital services. And then also encourage civil servants to be innovative and not afraid of failure. And all this responds to the four open government pillars that we, um, we embrace. So I will give you a brief introduction of he uh, the history of PL Network. We hope to change the culture within the, um, the government and to cut across the silos and bureaucracies. Groups from different ministries of civil service were trained to tackle issues and policies that we were raised by the citizen and civil servants on the Taiwanese petition website called JOIN, which Tiffany will talk about this later on in the afternoon. However, there was a clear need to have a fixed group of civil servants trying to better facilitate communication and collaboration within and across the 31 ministries. Since October 1st in 2016, when Audrey Tang became the digital minister, she started PDs and called the, mini, the middle to senior civil servants who are familiar with planning, communication, digital tools to be part of the fixed group. We later call this group the Participation Officers Network.
And this is the quote that, uh, because I joined PDF a few days before, and I hear from this, um, about this quote from Pia Macini, and I really like this one. Um, you, never get a ch you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this, is, this responds to the multi-stakeholder governance system that we are building, which I will explain this more later on. And I think it's really Im important to embrace failure. Failure should be allowed and be part of our culture. We try, we may success, and we may fail. And if we, if we fail, then we learn. And I'm going to share with you um, two case, case studies that we did. And overall, I think we've done around 30, 35, 36 collabor collaboration workshops um, so far in the past two years. And the first case study that I'm going to share with you is the online income tax system redesign. The online income tax system takes a form of a website that allows taxpayers to pay report their income and get, get tax rebate. Um, every month, um, participation officers, they bring topics they feel needed to be discussed to the um, monthly meeting. And then they will do a vote on what meeting, uh, what kind of topic that we are going to uh, discuss further um, in the following months. And this is part of the agenda setting um, stage. And this is the page of the e-petition website. It's actually not a petition that a, peti a petitioner signed. Um, the peti the peti uh, petitioner is a, a UX UI designer that uh, find this income tax, uh, online tax system really difficult to use. So she op uh, he opened a forum on the efficient website and hoping to get more feedback from other um, users. And then maybe he can turn those feedbacks into the proposal that he is going to uh, do on the, on the e-petition website. But before that, the PO already act on this. So it doesn't, he, he didn't really actually start the petition and the government already respond to that. So when the POs um, saw this uh, forum, and then he started to raise this issue and then also bring it onto the table, as I mentioned. And Audrey also really liked this idea to include um, this issue uh, in the voting pool. So then everyone is really looking forward to uh, tackle this issue. But before, before we tackle this issue, it, we really need to understand why people are, fi are feeling um, this, this website so difficult to use. So we really need to identify who are involved within the whole thing, not just about the end users, but also who are the policymakers, who deliver this service, and a lot more. So these are the people that we identified before we actually started the workshop. And it's really important to have diverse groups because diversity leads to holistic view. And we don't really want to listen to the, the majority opinions, but we look for um, diversity. So there are end users, petitioners, designers, IT strategists, frontline staff, and also a lot of uh, civil servants from different departments. And this is a closer look at the workshop that we do um, live streaming on 360 camera, also a, a general camera. And so, you, so people online who cannot participate in the workshop, um, they can also have a say and understand the whole process. This is the first workshop that we conducted. And the end of this workshop is to really understand um, people's journey and what they find difficult in each stage 
because people might come into the workshop and started to complain a lot of different things. But it's really important to understand where the problems occur and who can actually fix it. So we did a service blueprint um, and a user journey to identify those things. But it is not um, complete because those people who already done the, the tax paying, they, they talk about this after their experience, but we haven't actually looked through how people, do, how people did the whole process. So we, um, we ask the uh, POs and also those civil servants within different departments to conduct usability testing process. I know it's intimidating, like asking civil servants to do usability testing, but it's not about like training them to be able to do a proper usability testing. It's more about empowering them to really understand um, the difficulties that happens between different users and having the mindset to engage with those people and build the service or policy based on human needs. So then we identify um, different issues. Then we aggregate it all of the information and synthesize them and bring them to the next workshop. And after a few following, um, work, this is actually, this is the first one. Um, the first workshop after the, the, the first one. So sorry, this is the second one. And those, those people that I showed you before, the diverse stakeholders, they actually joined the workshop and co-create the, the solutions. So I mentioned that during the first workshop, we get people's feelings and um, the problems that they faced. And also after the uh, usability testing, we gather more information. And then we show them actually one page by page about what are the difficulties during the process. And it's not just about the text paying process online, it's also about how do they prepare to pay the tax and also what happened after they, they pay the tax online. So it's the whole, whole journey. We need to think about that uh, holistically. So during the, the second workshop, we understand and identify the, the problems. And then we started the very initial co-creation about just imagining what it can be like. And the second one, we, cause we gather like different ideas, but ideas are ideas. We need to uh, be clear if these ideas are actually correspond and can really respond to the problems that we identified. So on the second workshop, we um, facilitate all the different stakeholders to do the prototype on what they want in the future um, paying, tax paying system. And th something really interesting struck, uh, that struck me is the civil servants, they really understand how different things work. So for example, the people from taxation uh, department, they know um, the language they use and they, because they, they make the laws and everything. So, but that's also the, the other problem that the end user find those languages that the government use is really difficult for them to understand. That's why the process, that's the only reason why the process is so difficult for them. So it's not just about the interface and the process. Language is also very important. And we, we, if we don't include those voices from the end user, we will never know that the people from the textation um, department, they actually also have a role in this. So it's really important for people to understand um, their role and to identify what they can do uh, in, the, in the different workshops. And because we have the uh, third workshop that allow people to do the prototype, then we need to have this, uh, the fourth workshop that allows people to actually uh, envision what it looks like um, in the future. So people can test it 
and make sure it works before we launch um, the website. So we, include, we included more designers within the process for them to help um, the illustrate the, the interface that the people like and also the process. And after that, um, we hand this over to the outsource company. They, are, they were actually in the, in the workshop, so they can uh, tell participants about their difficulties during the workshop. So we don't have something that is ready for the outsourced company to code, and then they realize that they cannot do anything about it. So outsourced company was also um, in being involved in the process. And then we have a new website um, in this May, this year. And we got lots of positive feedback from the users saying that it's, it's, it's easier for them and it's quicker for them to finish the text paint process. So the main, the main change of this, this service is, I think cultural change comes to the first because the civil servants that we work with, they understand the user more and they know how they can provide a public service better during this process. So they include more of this kind of thinking and what they learn during the workshops and then turn that into the RFP, the request for proposal for the next year. So they include more of this kind of thinking. And also the, the digital, the, the digital uh, online text paying system, um, the process is clear. It's step by step and people will be able to see the real time calculation. So by the time that they're filling their information, they know why they're paying this much tax during the process. Also, there is a guide before they do the, uh, they, they started paying tax online because there are four different portals for them to, to be able to get into the system. And sometimes they don't know what they have to prepare. Do they need to have a card reader? What card do they have to have? The health card? or some other uh, information that they have to be, that, that have to have ready at hand. So we also tell them that these are the things that you have to prepare before you start. And then, so they don't have to go back to the start to find their cards or card reader. So um, I think the whole process broadened the horizon of civic participation and opportunities for collaboration across the government. And PL Network and multi-stakeholder collaboration workshop created alternatives for civic participation and opportunities for collaborate across the government. People have another option to have a say apart from voting, protesting on the street, creating an active discussion on the internet, which is a very common social phenomenon in Taiwan. And the case study, the second case study that I'm going to share with you is the wildlife conservation in Penghu. And the PO of this topic is actually here, um, Patricia, uh, Patricia. Yeah, so she will actually share with you some of her uh, experience that are my perspective. So the Penghu is, is an island just um, nearby the, uh, the, the southeast of Taiwan. And I can show you the, the area. So Taiwan is out over there and this is Penghu. And there are a few islands around that area. And there is a particular um, sea area that people were talking about um, should they should they um, stop the fishermen's fishing behavior around that area and this is a con it's a contradiction between so many different industries between fisher um, fisher industry fisher industry environmental production groups and the tourist industry So we also include um, 
different stakeholders in the workshop is even more than the one that I showed you before, because there are three different ministries involved. And the civil servants from Council of Agriculture, Minister of Interior, and actually more than that, Coast Guard Administration, Ministry of Fi Transport, Ministry of Finance. And also we include lots of, um, we, lots of uh, chief of villages, uh, petitioners, and local authorities. And there are also fishermen's association, environmental protection groups, tourism industry groups, and also, also us. And because it's a, a very um, remote area, we, uh, a suburban area, so not everyone is actually able to use Slido. We, we include Slido in our meetings just to let people to have better chance to, to have a say. So we also um, provide them some notes that they can write it on and pass on to the facilitators, which I will show you later. And what I want to uh, address more on this case study is um, about listening to the people. We uh, had a trip before the workshop to actually get in touch to those stakeholders. Um, we were on this boat. I don't know if the photo it will show, but it's like a very dramatic trip. It, the, the ship goes down or up and down, up and down. And, and then we were actually in still interviewing people uh, when we were on the boat. So we interviewed um, the, the chief of the villages and we observed the, the areas and also talked to more uh, chief of villagers. And then just one day before the workshop, we tried to gather as many as feedback and their views from different stakeholders, like I showed earlier. And more discussing with different, um, with POs and uh, the civil servants from the Ministry of In Interior. And the, the interesting thing of this topic is they are, they are protesters outside the, the workshop. So we decided to have two uh, rooms for, for a workshop. One, the first one is the, the big room that people are able to see the live streaming from the second, the second room. And those people are the MPs and um, politicians and protesters like those people who really want to have a say, um, they, will, they will come to this room. And Audrey is a company name in the first room. And the second room uh, includes the peoples from, also from diver, diverse um, groups. So those people who are, um, those groups in the first room, they have representative in the second room as well. So we, we are not missing out. Uh, people's voice, but it's just so difficult if we are going to have a work like a meeting that includes 100 or 200 people. It's not going to have like it's really difficult to um, have the outcome that is that is solid enough for us to take further. And the digital tool that we use usually um, during the collaboration workshop is the real time board, which you will get a chance to. Uh, have a look and work on that later. We use the real time board to do the mind mapping, like what you did earlier, but we did it in a more structured way that allows us to capture different people's statements and synthesize them and organize them in a sensible order. So it makes sure, it makes sure that we don't um, neglect anyone's voice, but we also get a chance to reflect on those statements in a more structured way, which you will get a chance to um, work on that later on the data integration uh, topic. So this is how the mind mapping will look like. Um, this is the sheet that they were able to uh, make the statements. 
and hand it over to the facilitators. So both analog and digital version of, of having a say. And it's very important for us to, to document everything, just like how, how it was and how it is on, on the Vita 1 deliberation process. And this is what they came out. Their, idea, their ideas after they identified the problems before. So the workshop process includes um, identifying problems, things like the information, and also define the problems. And then later on, they will have to come up with uh, feasible solutions. And after that workshop, it's really important to be able to capture all of the feedbacks and all of the ideas and then turn it to the next phase, which is the policy making process. So one of our colleagues helped to turn all of the ideas from the workshop in a more structured way into a format those, that those policymakers can understand. So they can deliver that later on. And also we have a hack folder that have all of the process and during, before, during, and after the workshop. So people can build their knowledge on that and also avoid talking about the same issue, having the same discussion again. They can actually build something upon that. So there's a question? Yeah. Could you please um, take the microphone? So you had talked about the two, two meetings that took place. Yes. yes, the one with the stakeholders and the yeah. one with the protesters, and the protesters also had a representative in the stakeholders one. Yeah. Yes, so uh, my question is just, was all of the input also documented from both, from the meeting with the protesters as well? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's documented. Do Audrey want to... Uh... Yes. Yeah. And then I will talk about uh, more about the participation officers network. Oh, sorry. I think there's one slide missing from, uh, from pa Patricia. Do, do Patricia want to add any, anything onto that project? I'd like to share later. Okay, cool. So Patricia will share about this project on her view and her, her experience on working on this later on. So why do we want to um, have the cross-ministerial um, collaboration group within this, um, the government? I think there's one thing it's really important because all of the problems and difficulties that we are facing now doesn't really have a single owner. So we cannot say, oh, drunk driving issue is need to count on the Ministry of Justice. Also, Ministry of Welfare and Ministry of Transportation are also very important because it's not just about making the law even more difficult. It's also like, how can we prevent this? And how can the police um, act on this better? during their day-to-day -day work. So we really cannot work alone. We have to work together. And that's why the participation officer network is so important to be able to cut across the silos and bureaucracies within the government. So um, as I mentioned before in the his history of the PO network, uh, we recruit some passionate civil servants and authorize them fully. So we don't force them to do anything and that allows them to be responsible for themselves and, and actually do a better job. So we also encourage those um, POs to be brave and ask for help wherever they need. So these are the, um, there are 31 ministries um, in Taiwan and all of the ministries, they have at least one representatives 
um, from, from their ministry. And there are around 60 POs at this moment. And those POs from this uh, participation officers network, and they need to record, uh, paraphrase, and facilitate the collaboration workshops. So they, they are not also um, a network. This is not also a network that allows them to, to work together across different ministries. It's also a network that allows them to serve the citizens better. And we would like to make the policy making process more open, transparent, um, participative, accountable, and inclusive. And who, but who should be included in the multi stakeholder collaboration workshop? As I mentioned before, um, during the case study, we usually identify um, different peoples like policymakers, service providers, end users, experts, um, different organizations that really care about this issue, and also maybe corporates that they actually have um, a role in this topic. And the more people participate in shaping the infrastructure, they, the more they would like to engage. And I would like to share with you um, about the process. The old process is, the, this is the traditional process of policy making. So politicians, uh, we work with civil servants to generate the policy and they work on the process, system, maintenance, regulation. And users usually are the people who get to know about this at the end. But it's really difficult for them to change that because um, some, of the some of the laws are already being passing at the parliament and they cannot really do anything about it. And if, if we have a protest, we can just postpone it. Like also yesterday, um, we shared about the sunflower movement and the deal between Taiwan, the trade deal between Taiwan and, the, and China. And that's actually something the same. It also being just, um, people just ignore it. It's not going to be passed, but we cannot do anything about it. And we don't really come up with a solution that address the problem that we're having. Like, why do we want to have the trade deal? What's the, the initial intention to have that? We actually don't have an, an action to respond to the original intention. So we want to avoid that because it costs a lot to go through the process and nothing really happened afterwards. So we would like to include pe different people's vo uh, voices and views. And those users are not just end users. They are diverse stakeholders, like I mentioned before. And we aggregate their, their point of views and the problems that they're facing, their needs, and then generate service based on their needs and the problems that they're facing. And then develop the system and do the policy check and then work on the regulation and maintain, and maintain that the whole, the whole system. So when it goes to the feedback, people were generally happy about it because all of their concerns are already being aggregated in the beginning. So in summary, um, we would like to make a gentle impact, just like the little water drip. It's, it's incremental, it's slow but incremental. And also doing, more, doing is more effective than talking. So you will actually get the chance to work on the whole process later on. Multi-stakeholder government system is the system that we're building and it creates alternative for a civic participation. And so we don't, it's, it's alternative responding to the traditional uh, democracy such as voting. And we would like to embrace evidence. So you will get a chance to work a lot on the statements and how you reflect on those statements and how you organize them and turn into something meaningful, insightful. And you can have a solution based on those insights. It's really important. So we would like to embrace evidence a lot. And the last one is change the culture through empowerment. 
and co-creation. So the whole process is not just the process that we want to solve the problem, but it's also a process that helps us to build up the capabilities. And we can always learn from each other. So because we will have an exercise, yeah, there's, I'll take one question. Hello. Um, I don't know if, the, if, if this was addressed yesterday, but um, when you have a PO from a ministry, does that mean that there is already buy-in from the CIO? Or is there ever a case where like the PO wants to join the process, but the CIO has not, is not bought in? Yeah, I think Audrey can answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so in, in Taiwan, every ministry CIO is a deputy minister also. So, so it's not like their job is only CIO, they're also the deputy minister. So by having POs report to the deputy minister, uh, if the deputy minister think it's not a good idea to engage in multi-stakeholder conversation, uh, usually they do it for political reasons, like they will give a full political context of why it's not a good idea. And, and we do see that also the PO sometime in the monthly meeting would say that this case, although you know the petitioners really want to talk about, it is actually the purview of, for example, another branch of government, uh, of the president, uh, and, and so on. And so our deputy minister thinks it's not the best thing to talk about right now. Uh, case in point is that there was a petition about banning the uh, flag of the PRC from display uh, in Taiwan. And, and um, the PO um, may want to talk about it, but the deputy ministers of all the relevant agencies think it may not be the best uh, topic for multi-stakeholder meeting. Uh, eventually, I think that's going to be put into a referendum, maybe, <laughs> end of this year. <laughs> but, but, but it is, frankly speaking, beyond the scope of our usual collection. Okay, so I just gave a brief introduction of the tools and methods, and don't worry about if you don't um, being able to understand everything, because we will. I will also uh, do a inter short introduction between different exercises. So we use design and technology to accelerate those strategies as I mentioned before, so I will show you some of the methodologies that we use. They are not all of them, but they are particularly, like those uh, tools and methods that I'm going to show you are the core uh, methodologies. And the tools and the methods are, that you will be able to see later are just like the, the top of the iceberg. And thinking and ways of working is actually the everything that uh, we we use we use tools and uh, we use tools to elaborate thinking so thinking and capabilities can be transferred better so actually at the end of today i would like to invite you to actually think about what tools and methods you can build in your work it's not just about there is one set of uh, tools and methodologies that you use. You can actually turn into um, those things that we want to demonstrate and into something that is useful for your day-to-day -day life and work. This is the double diamond program, um, di double diamond um, that, we, that we use just to, it's a framework for, for different processes. So, it's an overarching process and it gives people a good idea about where they are and what they can do at different stages. So the stages that we uh, include will be discover, define, develop, and deliver. And the lines, the, why the lines goes up and down like, is because it's um, divergent and convergent, divergent and convergent. So when you do, uh, when you're at the discovery stage, you will be able to get as many information as you want. And then you take the time to synthesize the information and define the problems. And then develop is like you get a chance to come up with as many uh, ideas as you can. 
And during the delivery stage, you have to synthesize and see what's working and what's not working. And then you deliver a solution. And it's, it's actually not a, a perfect framework. Like in the real, in a real li life, we won't have only two diamonds. We will have something like, like this. So you will have to do a little bit of um, uh, discovery and then maybe synthesize the information a little bit and then do more discovery and maybe have some ideation. But you feel like the idea is not really responding to the problem. So you may need to identify, interview more people and do more research. So the process is iterative and you can create your own process based on the, the framework. And this, uh, this slides give you, this diagram gives you more information about what can be included, what can be included at different stages. So like um, this one, like mapping who's involved is like the stake, stakeholder mapping that we can do, that we, we are also actually doing um, in the, the first exercise. And then we're not including this method over here, uh, in today's workshop, but it's good for you to know that um, it's also very important to do interview and shadow people in a good way, like to understand their behavior and their difficulties. And then also during this process, we get a chance to identify problems and this part will be included in their exercise too. And their exercise three will be about um, developing ideas. And then after developing ideas, we need to get a chance to reflect on those ideas and how does these ideas respond to the problems that we identified earlier. And we're not including these three later on, but it's also good to know that uh, we need to get feedback from different stakeholders. Also, we need to refine the business model, like how does this going to work? And we also need to know how we measure the impact before we deliver it. So uh, it's, we, we can use that uh, outcome to prove the service or policy later on. So during the discover and define stage, we will use the first tool called issue mapping instruction. And this is a tool that allows you to put different um, statements um, and even not statements, like different research piece into this format. So you get a chance to reflect on different, uh, different issues and stakeholders and what you are going to do later on. So let's take a closer look. Um, before, before we actually work on a topic, it's really important to understand what, are the pro what the problems are and also what are the existing solutions are. So we map how, like, for example, there's one problem statement and maybe somebody talk about the solutions here. So we have to map it in this way. And when we have more and more problem descriptions, we have to start categorizing them. So it doesn't, like, we can handle those information better. But it's really important to have uncertainties here because sometimes when we are doing deliberation or when we are doing literature reviews, there are always statements that is not, not clear for us. And during the deliberation, we sometimes have the statements that some, somebody agree that is a problem and somebody say, no, it's not a problem, it's a phenomenon. So there are uncertainties that we have to discuss more. And the reason why we separate those informations in this way is because it allows us to be able to reflect on different statements properly. And also the, the second part is uh, identifying stakeholders. So these, these are actually connected together. If there is a problem statement that's being addressed, you have to also identify who addressed that. Is that an MP? Is that an end user? Is it a policymaker? And when you have more and more statements during the deliberation or the, uh, re the research stage, you can identify more and more 
uh, stakeholders. So these two are actually um, you have to uh, work on these two together. So you can see if there is any one that um, is missing during the the process. And the last one is about um, actions. So what are the current um, plans? What are the future plans? Is there any resources that we can use? So we are not actually going to fill this form today, but we have a, an exercise that can take you through this process. And this is the, the form that we provide zero servants during the research phase be, before they do the workshop. So this allows them to really have a whole picture about what this issue is. So they are not going to the workshop and start listening to people in a non-structured way. We actually need to be prepared so we can act better on that. And we are not wasting people's times. Okay, so during the, that is a tool that helps people to put in their research data and being able to define the problems. But during the discovery uh, stage, there are more tools that allows people to, to identify problems and, and needs. So there are uh, three different tools that I just mentioned that correspond to the tables that I mentioned earlier. So we will work on these tools later on. And there's an instruction of how those uh, tools that we can use later. Um, then in the define stage, we have a tool called uh, challenge statement. And this is a very um, important part during the process because when we collect all of the information different statements problem statements or solution statements we need to be able to define them have a, a challenge statement is the statement that allows us to aggregate what we've learned during the discovery stage and that is the statement should be open enough for us to be able to um, brainstorming as many ideas as we can. So the statement I will uh, mention about this later on. This is just have a look, just let you to have a look how the tools look like. And during the development stage, um, we have also another tool called idea development stage, uh, idea development sheet on, 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 on the back of the room that you will get a chance to um, put in the problems that you identified earlier and then also putting the challenge statements that you have. So it gives you an, a chance to think about possible solutions and resources you may have. And then it's something really important over here. These columns, um, you can put in the information about um, risk and failures, um, risk and barriers, sorry. Because ideas is not, all of the ideas is not perfect and you need to be able to identify what can be the risk um, if, you, if you deliver that idea. So it, may, it gives us the room that we don't deliver something that can cause more problem. And when you, when you can, get a chance to find the solutions that can respond to the risk. Then maybe that idea is deliverable. And also, it's important to identify who can deliver those ideas. So who these people are, and what can be, what are the visions and reviews? So how do you measure the impact? And who can actually deliver these are also really important at the end of the idea, idea development uh, stage. So it's a really long talk today. I hope it's not too intimidating to you. Do you have any questions? Cool, so I'll take the first question. Uh, 
Hello. Good morning. Uh, so my questions are uh, uh, not into the details, but my main concern is how are you inviting the users? Like how long does it take? What's their time involvement? What are the incentives for them to show up? If they have work that they have to miss, do you compensate in some way? How do you make them arrive to the sessions? Like the specifics about the participation of the people affected by the problem. Yeah, okay, so we usually have um, three weeks to prepare um, the workshop. Around three to four weeks because we have to notify people beforehand. So we don't really get much time to like it's not like two months or three months, it's just usually less than one month. And the incentives for those people, um, usually it's, it's based on their interest. So um, many of those people who sign the petition, but not just them, it's also important to include experts, um, like those people who really know the nuance between different issues uh, within the topic. So we want to create the group dynamic that is really diverse. So during the research stage, like I mentioned before, the, the stakeholder mapping exercise, we usually do their exercise uh, during the pre-meetings with, um, within the government across different ministries. So we ask them to give us the, the list that they may think who will be capable of doing the discussion or who should be involved during the pre-meetings. And then we go through the list and curate the, the best groups for, for different topics. And then you adapt, like for example, in the Fisherman, you went to the village because you adapt how you reach to them depending on who they are? So the, the people from the agriculture, they actually have those connections. Yeah. So do, uh, do Patricia want to talk a little bit more about that? Like how, how, how does the list being generated and how do you connect that with them? Hi, I'm Patricia. Uh, in this Penghu case, uh, we, with the step of the, our Council of Agriculture, we are always keep a good connection with fishermen and the Fishermen's Association in daily life. So when this, uh, when this uh, issue comes out and, um, and we inform them and invite them to uh, attend uh, the meeting and uh, they show highly concerned and uh, with a uh, highly will to attend this meeting. So let's, uh, to contact the people, it's not a question to us, okay? Yeah, and as far as I know, the incentives, as I mentioned, that is sometimes it's based on their interest. So, um, we don't really pay those people most of the times. It's based on, like, they really want to have a say and they want to make a change. So that's their incentive. But I'm not sure, like, because some of the ministries, they actually pay those participants with their own budget. But, yeah. I just mentioned, uh, I just think um, about that. Because, it's a little bit a uh, paradox in this case because uh, uh, when this proposal was es established, um, some people to encourage the fishermen's uh, community to treat the uh, men who made this proposal as a, a kind of enemy, I think. So they maybe have some negative emotion on this issue, and uh, the people they think if we uh, if we don't show up, and uh, maybe it will harm our interests. So let uh, merge the people to come out. Okay, yes. Um, this is remarkable. Um, 
I, how, how are the CIOs empowered um, to like the, the POs? How, how did you break through the barrier of getting the CIOs to accept that the POs exist within their offices? I'll handle that. Okay. Um, very carefully. <laughs> so, um, so it's true that this is somewhat um, experimental, right? This is basically a way so that the CIOs actually to, to work outside their comfort zone. Uh, but on the other hand, um, it also gives CIOs much more legitimacy if they figure out who is the actual agency in charge of this policy issue. Because if you compare the uh, status before we had a PO network, we still have the e-petition platform, but it is a common observation that if the petition pertains only to one agency, it usually gives a good um, solution or at least a dialogue of the pro of the problem. But if it is a cross agency, not necessarily cross ministerial, if it is cross agency problem, all the petitioner gets is a explanation rather than a real dialogue or a solution. And this is a well observed fact of the joint platform um, before the PO network is formed. So it's identified as a weakness of the platform uh, by popular media. And also it makes the CIOs look actually bad if all they can do is to explain the problem instead of solving them. So it's also a way for them to, to politically leverage other ministries who should actually support um, the, the same kind of um, uh, political agenda that they're pushing, but uh, wasn't possible because of the silos. So that's the political motivation uh, for the CIOs, for the PO network to exist. For the POs themselves, of course, um, it reduces risk. That's the, the easiest uh, uh, explanation of why POs uh, throw their time into uh, doing this. But also for the agency people, it also reduced the cost of them explaining the same thing over and again without getting a clear um, direction of where to improve the status quo and all in all this is a design to solve the coordination problem by getting people to commit on possible solutions before actually implementing it uh, but it's, it's not always uh, easy of course but as the PO network is stable as in it's the same 60 people right it grows a little bit but it's the same 60 people over the course of one year so just apply standard game theory prisoner style uh, thing because these people are stuck like with each other so it doesn't make sense to to just try to shove the problem away or things like that and it makes a lot of sense to to share food and, and build solidarity so that's the or origin of the design and with this design explained very carefully to deputy ministers they eventually uh, see see the light uh, uh, purely on political um, um, Calculus. Right. I have a follow-up question to that. How were the POs uh, selected or hired, and what um, skills or characteristics were looked for in selecting those people? And then finally, does PDIS uh, provide training for people in the PO network, and what kind of training? Right. So. Um, there's a national regulation, the direction for implementing the roles of participation officers in the executive union and subordinate agencies. Uh, that uh, is a great read. <laughs> I encourage you all to read it. Eventually, it's on, it's on Google Docs um, that, that I just pasted in. But in short summary, yes, we do provide training, but most training is through problem-based learning, that is the collaboration meeting and pre-meetings itself. And the POs um, that doesn't get petitions or uh, other collaborations like the, um, I don't know, National Palace Museum, um, which is part of the cabinet, um, and, and, and things like that, and the Hakka um, Council and whatever, uh, they become supporting crew uh, to the uh, collaboration meetings run by other ministries that are more busy. Um, so that's the training part. Um, as for the picking POs part, uh, we famously posted on um, 
the, the national uh, bulletin board <laughs> set by the civil society, the P PTT, uh, which is the equivalent of Reddit, uh, right? So we, we actually post it on the equivalent of slash r slash public servant uh, and, and say, you know, who want to be the POs, just speak up, but you first has to be a public servant. Uh, and so we, we did get some POs this way, um, but the requirement is that they are career public servants and they are usually senior ones. Um, and um, the, C the CIOs may not know them personally, but uh, authorize them uh, to basically lead a internal um, cross agency team exactly the way Pete is, is uh, well, facilitating, I wouldn't say leading, um, the, the PO network. So it's a fractal-like uh, structure. And the uh, Council of Agriculture has the distinction of passing its own regulation on, on participation offices of subordinate agencies. So the same, exactly the same structure is replicated on the third level and the fourth level uh, agencies uh, with the same time structure and training structure. So, so this is like a fractal way of, of doing more holistic um, selection. And it's all vetted by the CIO, of course, but the PO also has to um, volunteer for it, like they has to agree with it. And we try to have POs led by career public servants that are senior uh, and they're not, and not by political appointees because otherwise they just get rotated out. Yeah. At the central, uh, the, the chief information officers who are also deputy ministers. So uh, each ministry may have one or two or three deputy minister and one of them are bound to be the CIO. And is, does the CIO have the purview of the technology budget and kind of digital community? Within the ministry, yes. And ha Sorry if I missed this. Has uh, information that's surfaced through these PO events resulted in changes in legislation, like changes in policy at the legislative level? Uh, it's easier, far easier to change in the regulation and policy level because that's something that the administration can decide by itself. Fortunately, most of the petitions are targeting this level. Um, but if it does require a law change, um, then we, we need to work with the legislators somehow. So just like uh, the Vita One um, setup uh, introduced uh, yesterday, sometime we uh, invite, actually they invite themselves, the uh, aides of the MPs and even MP themselves watch over live stream and so on uh, in anticipation of the administration proposing a bill draft. Uh, that's a Taiwan's uh, constitution basically uh, allows actually calls for the administration to propose its own draft bill for the parliament to deliberate. Uh, and so we see ourselves as doing homework, research work <laughs> for the MPs if it does come to a law change. But we have no control over how MPs uh, interpret our suggestions, but we can prepare up to the point where we send a draft bill. But um, to be perfectly honest, uh, these um, e petitions, they are very popular as MPs' own topics for inquiries for draft bills also. So sometimes even before we get to the point of collaboration meeting, some MP would just harvest uh, this as their agenda. Uh, and that complicates political matters a lot. <laughs> but fortunately, the majority of uh, those e-petition collaboration workshops are about policy and budget and regulation level things. Do, can I? Yeah, or we, can, does, we can hand it off each one, uh -huh. one, one, one. I got, well, I got, yeah. I got two more there, Did, quick. Does, do legislators then actively participate in the process? Yes, but not the full process. Um, and and that's, that's, that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> um, what, what level of awareness would you say the civil service community in general has of the program? Like, would you say 10% of civil servants who are kind of are in this milieu are, are aware, or is it 80%? Like, what? Well, of the 23 million people in Taiwan, around 5 million uh, has used the platform. So, I'm, I'm sorry, of the civil servants, yeah, the people in government. Of the civil service, I'm sure that because there's quite a few very high profile um, petitions concerning the welfare of public service. So I don't have hard numbers, but I think over half uh, of the public service are at least aware of, of this platform and, and the related uh, PO network. Uh, and, uh, but I don't have the, the numbers, maybe Andy does. Yeah. Um, Thank you for sharing all of this. this the, um, the PO network is such an unusual and progressive approach to governance. It's like both inspiring and like really depressing, I think, as an American. Um, um, my question is, uh, comes from ignorance of, of sort of Taiwanese social dynamics. 
um, who, what are the marginalized or historically disenfranchised groups and how do you reach them? And in, in the context of that, how do you define diversity? You mentioned many times diversity as a, as a goal for, for the collaborative groups. So I think Audrey can answer the first question. I will take the second question. Um, so how do we identify those um, like diverse groups As, um, during the so when we when we got the the information about what topic are we going to tackle in the following month, we will start doing research. And uh, the way that we do research is we started uh, to look at. Uh, what people already been mentioned and discussed about on the it petition website, and also we would like to ask civil servants like uh, POs about is there any meetings that has been uh, been held to discuss about these issues and who are the stakeholders involved in the previous meetings, and also we will look at journals and public debates and by looking at information from different channels we get a chance to know what the stakeholders are and by identifying those stakeholders we get a good look about how the group can be formed for the collaboration workshop does this is answering your question um, yes and are there is there a major group that is historically disenfranchised in Taiwan? I apologize for such a okay. I think question. Audrey can take this one. Um, well, yes, um, I think the the Fisher the Fisher people they're they're actually traditionally um, very wary of any so called participatory <laughs> processes. Um, they're they're far more used to like this top down um, like power over people uh, kind of organization, and mostly because they're in a difficult position. Really, the the near sea fishing itself is um, in danger of disappearing, as uh, far as I know, uh, especially around the Penghu area. Um, in the coming decades, um, there's a problem of overfishing. There's a problem of uh, lots of things. And um, because Taiwan has such a um, atmosphere of sustainable ecological uh, development and the ecological groups are far uh, more active in uh, social media and whatever other um, organizations. So, so they see themselves as somewhat as uh in, in many local issues as well as national issues. And in fact, it was framed uh, because this Penghu case is our first uh, marine national park that's open to the public. Um, it seemed as very symbolic, like um, the, the, in the interest in the name of marine um, biodiversity, we're taking the livelihoods of fishy people away. That was the <laughs> initial framing of the discussion. And so, um, but gradually they, they discovered that first, um, this is not about uh, counting the people who show up. This is not about making a decision uh, right on the spot. And uh, that this is not about, um, for example, uh, their traditional way would be uh, arguing for particular MPs or councils people to uh, negate the, the whole process and stall the process. They have a lot of experience doing that. Uh, but after they uh, discovered that first technologically we make it impossible for protesting to uh, stall the actual um, discussion on the second room, and that the second room uh, turns out to be pretty balanced uh, to, to their interest, and that uh, there are common values like sustainable fishing and things like that that everybody nevertheless uh, agreed on. So as the collaboration meeting progresses, they become uh, actually Actually, much more active and constructive um, after the, the, the collaboration meeting and sometimes they go back and watch the whole live stream and <laughs> actually discover that there are points that are actually in their favor so um, there's no fundamental paradox that uh, or, or conflict of interest of the two or different sides that's the main message we uh, managed to get across and they become much more constructive um, afterwards uh, and uh, be, uh, put a lot of very constructive inputs um, so while not a fair Fairy tale, like I wouldn't say that all fishers people <laughs> locally have been turned. Very importantly, the the leader of the the local uh, fishing uh, association actually came to a very reasonable uh, spot where we can do constructive um, things on, like. Um, 
it, it makes a lot of sense to first um, provide alternative routes for their careers and uh, take care of the local livelihood and empower local NGOs and co-ops to co-own uh, the development program instead of having a top-down national service park, a national park uh, driven program and so on. So, um, those details are just um, meant to to show that um, the layered approach actually um, gets to the solutions that works for everyone that everyone can live with. And starting from that point, uh, they become become much more eager to participate in local civil organization um, after they they see that the government is not just bowing to five thousand people and uh, you know having a very heavy handed um, way on, on their living as the government actually was prone to do, especially local government. Uh, in the past decades. So that's how we gradually work the, on the disenfranchising issue. Uh, and I think the, the nationally visible press conference uh, that Patricia helped uh, is also very important in showing that this is actually, even if it's a election year, <laughs> we're taking a very balanced approach and instead of uh, succumbing to like over radical uh, interests that calls for a solution right now, right this year. Um, I suppose this is the time to keep asking questions about the the e-petition platform that you use. So those of us who uh, lived through Obama's little experiment with We the People and saw how cynically uh, the White House treated those petitions and also how the press didn't take them seriously and the advocacy community barely took it seriously. But I think there's a marginal conversation going on in the notes about trying to understand why Taiwan's experiment has thrived and what we didn't do here or what the conditions were that has allowed it to thrive in a way that the White House's approach was a failure. And so, can you say more about just like how it was uh, put into place? Who, you know, I mean, you could take these things and ignore them, right? Um, the threshold is very low. In the, in, the, in the White House's case, they started with a low threshold for what a meaningful petition had to be requiring a response, and then they steadily increased it. Um, they also thought, you know, well, they joked and said, well, it's all about legalizing marijuana and no one takes that seriously, right? So it's just the potheads who are most interested in getting attention to their issue. I mean, it's really 10 years ago, that was the attitude that this is not a serious issue and they're just online, those internet people, I think Obama said at one point, you know, that's, I guess, what they're most interested in. Instead of saying, this is an issue that's being ignored and I finally created a portal for people to get ignored issues paid attention to. And my goodness, there's actually a lot of people who care about this. Maybe we should pay attention. So I'm, I'm just wondering if you can say more about why it has worked there what, and what we can learn maybe for the next chance we get to do this here. I, I just, just before Audrey um, answer the question, I think I would either like to add something before that. So the, the ministry that is um, uh, conducting and responsible for the, the e-petition platform is actually over here in the National, Dep uh, the National Development Council. Um, so she, she is actually going to share about um, the experience later on in the afternoon. And so she can maybe add some comments onto this as well. But the, the, the multi-stakeholder collaboration model that I was talking about is not actually uh, the model that uh, directly or just to serve the petition website. Um, the model is actually can be used for any kinds of topics that's been raised by, by the public or by the civil servants within, within different ministries. So I think I just want to make sure that I, I understand that, but I, it, it appears to me as an outsider that what the petition platform has done is given everyone a common place to elevate things in somewhat of an equal way. I mean, as opposed to you're a celebrity, so your issue gets more attention, or you're rich, or you can 
raise a lot of money so your issue gets more attention. And so from the legitimacy standpoint, um, having that sort of neutral playing field uh, is good. Um, I mean, how, how is government supposed to listen? Uh, who should it listen to? I, I mean, obviously constituents, but the federal government, the constituency is the entire country. So uh, that's why I'm zeroing in on this. And it seems to me it, it gives a certain degree of political cover to people inside government if they actually want to do something about an issue to say, well, you see, there's a petition demanding that we pay attention to this. So there's a value in that as well. Different from saying, oh, some columnist in a newspaper is writing about it. So I'm, I'm trying to understand more about the question and also about understanding what is happening in uh, v Taiwan and Gov Zero. And it seems to me like part of the difference is that um, there is a outside of government uh, community activists taking responsibility for creating these multi-stakeholder groups and then inviting government into it. So it's not like someone saying, um, okay, so here's all this stuff, you government do something about it. It's more like taking an initiative to do something about it and, and in a way that will also assist and support the government. And so then they have more buy-in and specifically um, what I'm hearing is that you guys are working with the uh, administrators rather than the politicians. So it's like, how can we make bureaucracy's life easier by co-creating intelligent, responsible things, um, but not asking them to do it, but, but it, inviting them to participate in something that the initiative for it is coming from the public volunteer sector. I'm not sure if I'm understanding this, but that's kind of how I'm hearing it. Right. So um, the PO network is a spiritual reincarnation <laughs> of the <laughs> V-Taiwan project within the administration. So, so it is not structured entirely like V-Taiwan because the so-called volunteers, they are also career public servants and they often have other jobs. Uh, it's rare that we have a PO that are so fully authorized <laughs> that she can uh, essentially lead the whole PO network within one um, ministry or one council. Uh, it is true that many POs, they still double as, for example, uh, media officers or uh, they double as parliamentary officers. That's the two most common ones, but also planning officers and so on. So they're somewhat restricted in, in their role, not like full-fledged V Taiwan contributors who can, you know, play any role whatsoever. So there's some some institutional uh, parts uh, that PO play. Uh, it's not a pure volunteer network. That being said, uh, we try to recreate a volunteer network dynamic. So the, the peer selection, the process selection, and so on, all, all of that was lifted uh, from V Taiwan. So that does to answer your question. And so short question about um, the, the E petition and why we bootstrap the PO network using the e petition. <laughs> so the e petition platform came <clears throat> because <clears throat> of the um, National Forum on Economic Development uh, in 2014, and that was one of the main demand of the uh, people who show up at the National Forum. The National Forum was held because of the Occupy uh, Sunflower Movement called for a national constitutional forum, and uh, so the Ma ying uh, administration did not actually want to do a constitutional uh, reform forum, <laughs> so they did a more administrative uh, one instead, but uh, the people really wanted a uh, um, con constant um, way of setting the agenda of administration and the threat, the un unspoken threat was always that if that's not done, we're just go ahead and occupy you again. So there's a political will um, often just hangs around this e petition <laughs> platform that that um, basically said if you don't make it legitimate enough, um, something like occupy will happen again. So, so that's the kind of unspoken uh, context of how the e-petition platform was, was done. And finally, uh, the e-petition platform was um, developed by the uh, then freshly built uh, NDC. The NDC was a new agency formed by the combination of two very old agencies, um, the Council for Economic Planning and Development, and also um, the pub, the, um, uh, the Council for uh, research development and evaluation. And so these two were respectively uh, responsible for long-term plans. 
and for evaluation, uh, like auditing the other ministries to make sure they follow those plans. And now once those two uh, agencies merge together, it become very powerful because they're uh, able to essentially set an agenda and make sure that other ministries are held accountable for the agenda. And so the political uh, power of the NDC as the chief agency to, to work on the joint platform and also the national open data platform uh, far exceeded what would uh, be possible if it had it uh, be done with one of the planning or the um, you know supervising uh, agencies. So this like super uh, ministry uh, is, I think, one of the key ingredients why it becomes so effective because they can hold the ministries to account if they don't respond uh, substantially. All right, I think we'll move on. Also, one thing in, in our case, Mika, coming back to your initial point, is the level that it should be done at the city level and not the, the federal level to make it more attractive. And maybe that is some part of the comparison. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll move on to the exercise part of it. The, the group that you're, you're a part of for the exercise is indicated by the, the color of the, the dot you have. And if you don't have a dot, Joe, I know you don't, both of you. Um, I will, I will come give you, give you the color. And there are three tables. The, the color corresponds to the color up on the board behind you. And then Fang, Patricia, Tiffany, and Shu Yang will, will lead you in the exercises. And then we'll co keep coming back together periodically. Anything? Yeah, Japan? No. Okay. Okay, let's find out. Okay, so now is the time for exercise one. We are running a little bit behind, so I will do this as um, a little bit quicker. Not maybe. Is it? Is it? Sorry, my slides is not working. So yes, could you could you help me with this? Uh, it's it's not responding. Oh. Okay, I will just give a brief introduction about exercise one. Like yeah. is the whole season. If they can do it, it's the whole season. Okay, so for the exercise one, uh, we're going through the discovery and def definition stage. So in the in the beginning, please look through the statements that you have on your table. Do you, can anyone see the statements? Could the facilitators um, bring people the statements for each group, for data integration? So please, please have a look on the, the statements on the issue cards that has been generated and it has different categories. So is it a problem statement? If, it's, if, it, if, it's, if it is a problem statement, then tick the box of problem. So there are different categories. And if there is, you also have to make sure that um, the reference, you have the reference. So is it your own opinion? Or is it something you find on internet and who said that? Data Just the data integration one. It's different picture in every everyone's mind. The so have a look and then and then start writing the statements that you have or you found on internet on the blank issue card. Different views. Okay, so yeah. Uh, And this is I'll go into the groups, and if you have any questions, you can ask me. Okay. Okay. So the question is, uh, 
Okay, so I'll just quickly explain what the statement is. So when you when you think about a topic, sorry, sorry, stop, stop, everyone, stop. Just listen to me. Okay, so if there is anyone who is questioning about like how can I make, how can I write a statement? Imagine what you did yesterday on police. These are all statements. Okay, so if you imagine that you are starting, you are starting to talk about this issue about data integration, and then you may raise uh, a lot of your point of views. They are all statements, and they can be problem like, what are the problems in in the in the issue integration data? Why do we have to integrate the first data? What what are the problems? And you can start making those statements. And if, if you sometimes when people have problem uh, statements, then they will talk about the the solutions. So if you if there is any solution that raise up to your up to your mind, then you can write it down. And if there is something statement that uh, some statement that are uncertainties, so you are not sure if it's question or is it is it a problem or is it just a fact, then you you put it uncertainties. But if there is any resources like laws or any NGOs or government bodies, they are all resources, you can put them down. It, do you have any questions? Okay. Is this clear to everyone? So who remembers, for the folks that were here yesterday, who remembers what our topic was and what we were discussing with Polis? How okay. can the city government use and protect local residents? Oops. How can the city government use and protect local residents' data? Okay. So we're going to be building off of that today. So for those that weren't here yesterday, you can catch up with your group, but that's really our question. How can, actually it'd be really nice, uh, can someone do, 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 write it back there so we can all see it? Nice and big. Okay. So based on that issue, now you're going to make these issue statements. Yeah, but, but that's actually a challenge statement because you already have a, like a focus area. But just, just forget about yesterday's topic. We focus on data integration and is there any data privacy or any it can be anything. You can decide in your within your groups. If you want to talk about privacy issue, then then talk about it. Because the, would you consider the privacy issue a sub issue? Would, would you uh, would you consider the privacy issue a sub issue of the data integration issue of a larger data integration question? Um, because yesterday, when we started from data integration, people yeah. started to ask, like, right. what kind of data uh, integration? Ah, I see. So you're starting. Is it about privacy? Is it about sharing data between different ministries? Or that makes sense. Yeah. So we're starting from exactly where we started discussing yesterday, which yeah. is data integration. No, so we're taking a step back. Well, yesterday they started with the topic data integration and then like everybody in the room had a different idea of what that meant. So we were like trying to figure out a
Hey everyone, we're going to have lunch or prepare for lunch at 12.15. So if you can use the remaining time to see where you can get in your groups and after lunch you can finish this exercise.
they, they feel that. Can I do our clap ones here? Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't do the clap ones, it's too much. I can do the, the, the DJ, DJ. I got what it. We need is a, we need a okay, everyone, clap once if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. Great, thank you so much. All right, here's what we're gonna do before we get started for lunch. Like, each group to go around and share. Is there any group that they feel um, you already finished everything for, this, uh, for the exercise one that you would like to share with you what you've done? Okay, cool. Uh, sure. Uh, we went through the exercises, and I guess we can maybe, I can just explain the categories we eventually group things into. Some of the major categories were mistrust, um, trust of data, data-driven injustice, you know, worrying that uh, misuse of data would kind of create injustices, intergovernmental barriers, collaboration between agencies in regards to using data, and an unclear public understanding of bureaucracy. So like what policies or practices exist right now in relation to data, and an unclear public understanding of transparency, like um, you know, what data is accessible. Um, and we've try, we tried to um, map some of the uh, ideas behind and below them, but quickly realized that we actually had like a resource gap um, because we, didn't, we couldn't find resources that would address these issues quite yet. Well, in that particular in that particular context, how do you go about documenting the resources that, like, if there's other people in the room, like, do you then ask people to kind of circulate around the room and put resources that they may know of from the different groups? Uh, we. Should I answer? Yeah, we, we, this is actually a full set of uh, education tool for public servants to learn um, the facilitation skills. So it's not uh, the tool we actually use during the workshop. Um, it's, that it's a tool for training them to be uh, more prepared uh, to be a nice facilitator, helping on um, uh, gener generating ideas with the citizens later on in the real workshop. Um, so here, uh, when we prepare, this is like the phase we prepare for the workshop. After we've done this whole full set of uh, toolkits, we're going to uh, create a, a document of how we analyze is this issue. Um, so we here actually means the public servants and PDs, uh, mainly POs and PDs team, will be the ones who create uh, the preparation of the workshop. Um, so after all this uh, process, done with the canvas, um, we'll come up with, uh, uh, we'll digitalize all uh, these uh, issue cards into post-its on an electronic uh, whiteboard uh, on the website. So Momo, can you come here and show me, show, us, show everyone what you're doing on your computer? Yeah. Right. So uh, what, what we've done so far for this past 30 minutes will be digitalized into a, a, um, a web, uh, what's that, e electronic version. We're going to put it up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so far, yeah, they're going to put it up. And, and this, this uh, real-time board, we call it real-time board, it's a tool called real-time board um, for digitalizing post-its. Uh, this, this canvas will be intensely discussed during the collaborative workshop with, uh, with uh, people who create the workshop, including PDs and POs and other public servants, and also the citizens we invited, uh, researchers, experts, to the real collaboration workshop. Is that clear to you? Cool.
So um, as, as Shu Yao mentioned before that we actually, during the workshop, we will digitalize those comments and statements real timely. So people would be able to reflect and add their thoughts real time as well. And it's shared with the wider stakeholders. Also the citizens who go online, they were able to see the comments uh, at the real time as well. So the document um, can be accumulated uh, over time. So if there's, there's another workshop, then they can use this as the base to start a new conversation. So see us. Just that I found it interesting that our group came up with some categories that were similar to that and was just curious if that's something that you know, often happens in your workshops that, I mean, not exactly the same, but that there's parallel themes that come up in, in each of the workshops. So, so actually, as Shuyang mentioned before, this is the preparation stage. So we do this training before the preparation stage to show how civil servants, they are able to um, aggregate the different information. So during the preparation stage, they should... Um, like delete those duplicated uh, comments and aggregate them all together. So at the end, all of your groups, um, we don't have to, this time to do this today, but um, at the end of the session, for, during the preparation stage, they need to be able to come up with a complete landscape of what the problems are and what the ideas are. And then that you they will use this information to be the input of the collaboration workshop. So they will show them this is what we've researched, um, we've done for the research. And if you have any comments, you can add on to that. Just a quick one. Um, I, I had thought initially we were killing it, but I'm also seeing the different ways that you can do this because our categories are closely correlated to your prob to the group's problem statements. So it's there's because I would have thought mistrust was a category, but it's actually the problem statement yeah. or the problem issue. Yeah. So it's it's just different ways of kind of framing the the challenges. Yeah. And it's really important that people um, get a chance to um, reflect on this kind of opinions based on this structure. Uh, actually, the um, mistrust, that level, of, those are the categories, actually, for us. Those are the ones that we created out of our groupings of, of problem statements. Um, mistrust? Uh, actually, it should be, it should be longer, because what is mistrust? Who mis what is the context of mistrust? It's, it's just a keyword. Yeah. So what caused mistrust? People have to elaborate more on that. Okay. So we're going to get ready for today's lunch. What I'm going to ask you to do is to count yourselves off one through five and then one two, threes, fours, and fives. Organize yourself by your groups. All right? Start over here with Shu. You're a clue hander outer, yes. <laughs> Can you stop presenting? Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, group one. This is group one. Group one. I am handing out clue sheets to your groups. Oh, not. Um, I'm sorry, the Mad Lib sheets, these? Can I hand these out? I'm not handing out clue sheets, just these. Oh, okay. Sorry, not the clue sheets. Not clue sheets, but Mad Libs. Introduction first. I'll hand that out yet. Oh, you don't want me to? Yeah, until the end. Well, I mean, it's fine if you have one. Can I have the clicker? Is this for the slides? Yep. Okay. All right. You guys ready for lunch? We can't hear you. You ready for lunch? Yeah. All right, that's better. Um, all right, welcome to lunch day two. So um, I did some research yesterday based on the polis question that came up, uh, consulted the necessary experts. So there's the recipe for those snack balls. <laughs> I'm glad that those are so well loved. Um, yeah, so again, lunch is an opportunity for you to process, socialize, and play. And today, um, I thought of working with the themes that you're being introduced to through the PO network, which is more of a discovery and problem-finding focus process. Um, also about seeking perspectives to build a complete picture. And also the fact that it's a guided framework for modeling complexity that makes kind of it possible to get a way to like tackle something that could be shapeless and infinite. Um, but I'm not going to share the inspiration for today's lunch because that would give it away. It is actually your job to discover what it is. And to do so, you will have to go around the room and ask experts who will have the missing pieces of information for you to locate what you need. So can the experts raise their hands? And Darshna, who's currently uh, getting plates down very bravely from a high place. Woo! All right. Thank you, Darshna. Um, yeah, so you know who to ask to find what you need. And now Darshna will be, or sorry, CS will be handing out clue cards, which you will fill out to locate ingredients, which will come together and form a complete picture of what your lunch will be. All right, so the ingredients are in the room, and let's begin. So just to be clear, you're, t you're working as a team, and you're all going to fill out your clue card together by consulting the volunteers. Yeah. 